start the day with like 60 grams of, of carbs, like that gets me ahead of the game. Especially with a workout like today. You can't really take much during the workout this morning. Like, because it's quite high intensity, so you don't, like, I'm not gonna bash you with a packet. This is gonna be kind of, kind of weird, but I also put some creatine in there. Oh, yeah. Just get it done. Yeah. People are probably gonna be like, what? It's pretty normal so far. <laughs> the whole creatine? Warm up. I'll try and be, I guess, done working out by 9.30. So I can be at work for 10. It's kind of when customers start coming anyway, I let the boys open up. That's toy. That one's toy. Will you do this before like a double as well? Uh, if I'm sore, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe like a, a cut down version. And I do like a mixture of the, I guess like the range of motion and stretching, dynamic stuff, but then also some activation stuff. Most of my injuries have always been tendons around the ankle, like Achilles, post tib, big toe, perineal. They've always been those types of injuries. So when I do a bunch of this stuff, I just don't get hurt. <laughs> Pretty much. I was pretty broken when I came back from Europe. Like mentally and kind of physically, and that was no one's fault. But I was tired. Yep. And like I just was carrying so many niggles, and I was kind of sick of it. Like just sick of being sick of being niggly. But I suppose I've got to do something about this. Otherwise, I'm going to be finished by the time I'm 35. And I don't want that either. No, this is. No, this is groundbreaking, but I did a bunch of reading and there's definitely a correlation between lack of hip extension and Achilles stuff. Um, a correlation between perineal tendon and a lack of stability and soleus calf strength. So you know, I was kind of building what I wanted to do in the mornings. It was like, well, I'll focus on those two things first. It was like, get some good hip extension some good rotational pieces and try and extend my body's ability to be put through hell and back. <laughs> How much of a focus has the calf strength been? A lot, yeah. yeah. Substantial. Well, you can see I've got a 24 kilo kettlebell at home. Yeah. That's pretty rad. <laughs> 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 that's, pretty, that's pretty extreme, right? Yeah. Um, Is it like something you work on weekly? I do something every day for it. Um, yeah like every day I do stuff always the seated seated calf raises pretty much every day because that's mainly that's hitting an activation soul, yeah, hitting soul, soul, yeah. Say, yeah and I think that's more of like an activation piece for me like 24 kilos isn't that heavy like for that muscle it shouldn't be because it takes 7 times you every time it takes a step but I think it just tells it to turn it on and kind of forces a little bit of more range of motion through the ankle as well and so by the time you go running, whatever, we'll do it an hour later, I guess the joints know what I'm going to ask of them. Hmm. Um, I don't know if there's any science to that. Don't care. Works for me. Someone will prove it later. That's all science, isn't it? Someone's idea that gets proven right later. <laughs> like a mad scientist. Uh, and I've had my fair share of like lower back kind of stuff as well. Uh, which comes from a bit of hamstring tightness so I've worked pretty hard on that in the gym like trying to isolate what that lower back strength looks like not just doing the same old um, which I guess you guys will get to see when we do that oh, this is just like 6 I think this is more like just the activating a bit of hip flexor a bit of stabilising like standing on one leg Yeah, I guess everything has to have a counterbalance, doesn't it? Nothing too adventurous, but it works. I work pretty hard on that, on that hip flexion, I guess. Like, 
Liban kind of looks at what's happening out the back, but I was interested in also like yeah, what was happening, like that knee drive aspect. Yep. Yep. Creating some power, being able to control that movement. And there's some cool stuff in the gym program that I kind of came up with that yeah, people like, I think. Okay. A little bit different. Well, not different, but a little bit different, I guess. Like Trying to think about run-specific stuff. You don't get much more run-specific than that action of the ankle. <laughs> that's, about, that's about as specific as you get. Especially these knit fabrics. Because they just, there's no way that's coming out. No. No, it's just not. <coughs> I reckon my training peak says I run about 125,000 kilometres. Like, since I started recording them at about 19. I reckon 65% of that's in the park. I reckon if I run, I don't know, like 60,000 K, maybe more in the park. Or like getting to and from the park included in that. Uh, we are going to do 10 by 1k, 8 to 10 by 1k actually, coach has given me the, the out at 8k if I'm not feeling it. Um, we're going to try and cover them in about 3 or 5, which is slightly slower than half marathon pace, uh, and have 60 seconds rest in between each one, be active recovery, so just jogging around for the minute. Um, point of today is just to keep lungs and legs ticking over without trying to dig any more of a hole. First couple of steps, you're like, oh, what version of me is turning up today? What version of me? Hopefully, it's a good one. Fingers crossed. Halfway? Oh, that's four. Oh. Seems to go. Lovely morning in the park. What was that last one? 302. 30 just under 302. That's what we wanted. 
Feeling pretty good, but just still a bit tired. 20 minute. I'll go back to the car, change my shoes. 20 minute warm down, and then go to the shop. Go to work. Sell some shoes. Sell some shoes. Uh, what have I got to do today? Two times you indent. It's due today. Go to that. Uh, so that's buying stuff for like next July. Next April, July. Get the crystal ball out. People think shoes just appear, but <laughs> they don't. Um, and oh, I think we've got some of the Essex Paris stuff arriving today, which is exciting. So get all those organised and bring all the people waiting for them. Uh, and then yeah, try and get to the gym this afternoon. Yeah, just all in a day's work, I guess. <laughs> I picked the boxes up the wrong way. The hard part is remember all the shoes are. What's happened this morning since we last, last uh, Well, I don't live the, the life of an elite athlete, so I, <laughs> I get to come to work, which I love. Um, and I guess for those, you've got heaps of viewers, you probably have no idea who I am outside of um, bombing laps of Hagley Park. <laughs> <laughs> all the gear. Um, so my wife and I own the front runner in the Colombo Mall. So the front runner's, uh, I guess, like a running specialty store, which is symbiotic. Um, and so yeah, I get to come here and see all the fun stuff a year in advance, and then order it, and you know, work with customers and coaches and, and medical people to you know help people with their footwear, which is pretty cool. It's a pretty good gig. It's, um, it's exciting. I guess it's kind of unique, like um, having, you know, running 100 miles a week more, um, having an in-depth understanding of footwear and human movement, um, and then being able to take that and, you know, apply that to real-world situations. It's quite a, a fun, uh, a fun gig. Sometimes a bit stressful, but you know, everyone's life's a bit stressful sometimes. <laughs> I guess to give people some, some backstory, some history, I uh, started selling footwear 14 years ago and kind of what that's cultivated in is a, I guess a, a love of running shoes, materials, uh, how they're manufactured and then breaking down I guess what the designer thought it should be for. Uh, what the R&D departments design the pieces, what they thought they should be used for and then joining that kind of together in a way that makes sense for the customer who comes into the store. And so like part of my role uh, or part of my job, I should say, is you know we see everything a year in advance. We're making assumptions around um, you know what materials we think are good, what footwear, how it's made. Um, how it's designed, you know, little features in the shoes that most people, I guess, maybe wouldn't think about, like sole flaring, forefoot stiffness, um, the depth in the upper of the toe box, whether it's heat welded or not, um, like little details that we think are important to kind of the end result that means that the end user has an enjoyable experience and therefore enjoys their run and like kind of keeps running. So, um, you know, the exciting part of that is working with some brands around their footwear, around their shoes, um, kind of explaining that direct customer feedback. Um, once they've put seven, eight hundred k into it, and I guess I am in that unique situation where I can put seven to seven hundred to eight hundred k in a pair of shoes and have my experience and correlate that with the knowledge of footwear that I've got, but then also you know have an in-depth conversation and really listen to what the customer's saying and how they found the footwear, how long did it last, how did it feel, how did it wear, you know, um, did it feel responsive, did it not, all, all those types of questions. And we can kind of create this, I guess, this relationship around footwear and, and, the, and the person going running, which for me is, you know, has always been, been pretty exciting. Um, and, you know, matching someone's goals and uh, foot functions and, and body functions to the footwear. Um, that we have available to us, which is always a little bit tricky because you kind of know what's coming. And like now I've seen stuff for July 2025 and we're uh, June 2024. It's like, man, if I had that thing that's a year in the future, this would be, but, but you kind of can't think about that all the time. So, um, you know, I love the science, um, the people involved, and then you, you know, I guess having that relationship with the, with the end customer. What do you do if someone comes in store yep. and they go, I'm 
just getting into running mm-hmm. help me? Yep. So I think that's a, that's a great question. And um, I guess what I always hone back to is we kind of call that our like triangle. So it's that fit function and feel, fit function and feel. The decisions are really easy to make if you always go back and trying to link a decision back to one of those things. So fit, fit's real simple, right? Like it's got to go around your foot. It's got to be long enough. It's got to be wide enough, not too wide. It's got to have correct volume and then it's got to be the right shape. So all of those things uh, you know, are, are pretty simple. Function, um, I guess, gets a, a little more difficult. Function can mean a couple of things. So that might be, does it work with our foot function? Does it help maybe um, some issues we have with our, our foot function or a, a poorer foot function? And then is it, is it fit for purpose? So is it for the road, is it for the trail, is it for training, is it for racing? Um, and then what do those differences in the footwear look like? And why should we sometimes challenge our foot behavior uh, in certain ways? And why shouldn't we when we want to race, whatever? Um, and then feel really, I guess, is the is the one that's kind of subjective, right? And that, for me, that's where I kind of get the most enjoyment out of helping someone subjectively learn about their bodies, how they feel in the footwear, what do they want to feel, um, how's the cushioning, how's the stack height, how's the balance, how's the stability. They're all kind of subjective terms that we wrap up and try and educate people, you know, rather than, rather than just assuming it'll work or me being really prescriptive, which I kind of started out a bit like that I guess when you get going and then as you learn um, you probably have a better time if it's a little bit more um, you sort of uh, working together to, to find the solution for someone and we you know we talk about solutions as kind of each show is a solution to a problem someone comes in with a problem we try and find a solution but if you go back to that fit feel function it, it does get real easy so there's 180 shoes on the shelf but chances are there's only four that are going to be exactly what you want inside that inside that triangle and then it comes down to you know maybe what colour you like or uh, which one just fits right. If we talk specifically about road running, just to clear that one up first, and if we talk about, I guess, the three different types of road running that you're going to do. So one is just general training, so that's sort of zone one, maybe into zone two, it's just cruisy, we're jogging, we're chatting with mates. Then we're going to go into that sort of like tempo, up tempo, marathon kind of effort, um, top end of zone two. Um, we're definitely running faster, we're running harder. Um, we want something that gives us back a little bit more pop. And then we've got our like our race specific and our race day um, sort of effort shoes. And I'll use the word effort rather than pace. So I think that's, that's effort is everyone can understand effort. So easy, medium, hard, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. For the shoes that we want easy, like the shoes we want to do our easy days in, like their primary objective is protection. So protection against hitting the ground, protection against um, foot mechanics, whatever you want to you want to coin the term. Um, and so for me, that's uh, adequate amounts of cushioning, subject for the individual, um, and uh, nice relaxed upper. Um, you know, we want to let our feet spread out a little bit. Obviously, not too wide, but we just want it to be super comfy. So, like a couple of my favourites: um, Glycerin uh, 21, soon to be 22, and the Triumph 21, soon to be 22. And I just like those because they're amazingly basic. They've got nice foams. Um, uh, one slightly more responsive than the other. There's subtle differences in the geometry, a little more posterior flare in the, in the glycerin that just kind of makes you run slower um, and just means I'm not overdoing those easy days. And then the Triumph, you kind of can get that a little bit going a wee bit just because of the Piva uh, midsole. And then for that sort of like high end zone two, heading into marathon type work that we do, um, I think then you can start exploring the idea of some sort of uh, plate as a longitudinal siphoner. And, and the footwear, and you want that for a couple of reasons. One, it just makes you more efficient and we can have, or more economical, we can have that argument another time. The second one is it's a great gateway into the race day product. So what we probably don't want to see is people going straight from, a, from an everyday trainer right into a super stiff, super resilient, super uh, bouncy uh, race day shoe. And so that just for me is like high risk. And obviously someone out there will be like, no, I'm fine, I can do whatever I want. So sweet, no worries. But I think as a, as, a, as a rule, I have seen people kind of break down when they try to go from this end to that end. And so when we have these kind of like, we'll, we'll coin them trainer races, they tend to use a slightly more flexible plate. Um, maybe it's Piva, maybe it's nylon, whatever, in the, in the harder plastic forms. And that just helps, uh, I guess, decrease uh, ground contact time, increases longitudinal stiffness, helps us get off that forefoot and increase the rocker in the front. Um, and then, so my favorite at the moment um, is the Socony Endorphin Speed 4. Um, I'll make a video on it sometime, but you know, if I was gonna pick one shoe off the wall and go, well done, it'd be that one. Um, and then um, we go into our rest air product. Now the rest air product, like, I think for me, there's a couple of things to look at here. One is obviously like the 
how much it costs. You don't want to be using it all the time. Uh, they don't last very long, so there's a planet aspect. I feel bad enough selling plastic as it is. Um, and then also the biomechanical toll running in super stiff, unless you've got a pathology that needs it, a super stiff um, shoe that uh, kind of flings you off the front. We're increasing uh, load up into that proximal hamstring. We're asking more of our hips. Um, and we should be trying to run faster than it, right? It's like wearing carbon wheels on your bike when you do race day training, you train in your, in your normal wheels. So, um, you know, the, the, the shoes are a little harder con to control. That's probably a really good word to use. So they're harder to control. You've got to keep firing lots of them to get anything back from them and run them efficiently. So um, I probably waffled enough, but that's how I kind of see like those three types of shoes. And again, like we kind of talked about solutions for each type of training we're doing and then using the right solution for the day uh, and the speed and the effort. Uh, well, it's 18 to 5. Uh, when did we leave the house this morning? 7? Quarter past 7? I think. Um, so I've worked out, run about 25k, got to work. Very lucky that I can have slightly gentleman hours and turn up at 10, about 10 a.m. And now we're going to go and uh, finish my day with a gym session, it's about an hour. And go home and um, see my family, which will be good. I'm looking forward to that. So we'll just go get sweaty one more time. Oh, it's hard. I'll do a K. Probably take me four minutes. I'll probably run a K faster than I can row it. Yeah, that warms you up. It's good. <laughs> non run related activities. Obviously the rower gets your heart rate up a wee bit. As you can tell, I'm still puffing, I am human. Uh, um, and then I do some warm-up stuff, so... Uh, skipping, I think, like, if you're pain-free and you can, like, skipping's not a bad idea, it doesn't need to be heaps. And then some ankle mobility with a band. And then some, uh, some, like, core rotation stuff with that, just to get that warmed up. Um, and I think, full disclaimer, not a PT, just doing the thing, you know? Don't come at me. <laughs> it probably looks like it's doing nothing, but it does. <laughs> what, what, what is it working on? Oh, it's like, like that talus joint traction. Just gets real gunged up. And I find that if I don't loosen it before I try and do like some squats or, you know, any sort of dorsiflexion movement, I just like fail. The joint fails me, so. Um, just kind of create some space in the joint. I like to like kind of work through the physio stuff first, so some of the stabilizers, um, some of the things I've picked up from the amazing physios I've worked with over the last 15 years that I've found that if I just don't do a breakdown. Um, and then some stuff that I've added, just I guess continuations of some of the things I've learned from the S&Cs, yeah, that I guess kind of prepare me to run well. It's not too bad. Three's the limit today, fellas. Oh, people still got to remember I'm fatigued to sh I think that's the other thing is like, we could come to the gym fresh. And of course you want to lift appropriate weights and that sort of stuff. Like, you know, there's no point in me having a 24 kilo kettlebell trying to do a single leg squat if I'm almost failing on 12. Um, but yeah. It never looks picture perfect all the time. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the eating, we, uh, Jamie and I came up with a system of like, um, if you're hungry, you probably need protein. If you feel empty, you probably need carbs. And that might resonate with some people. Um, so, um, but pretty much, I guess you have to split your protein energy with your non-protein energy. And so the carbs will fluctuate day to day depending on like level of exercise, like in terms of duration or intensity but the protein energy, we try and get that up as best we can. 
in like the big 200k, 190k weeks, that was a terrible rep. Um, uh, I, I struggle to eat everything, so we kind of prioritise what we feel like we have to. Like just pure volume, eh? but yeah, eat when I'm hungry. <laughs> well, basically, it's teaching you to have body control at end range. And it's a really nice hip flexor stretch. Uh, it's normally about five for each leg. And it might not seem like a lot, but once you've run like 25k this morning, you know. <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of comments. A lot of comments. Massive comments, yeah. That's my slightly mediocre day. We left the house at 7 a.m. this morning. It's now pretty close to six. Um, run 25K, work seven hours, come to the gym for an hour, get sweaty, and now I go home and see my family and do that bit, which I'm excited about after, yeah, a bit tired, a bit tired. Eat, sleep, repeat. Eat, sleep, repeat, baby. Let's go, let's go.